morning, church. Hope you've been doing really well this week. Well, we're really excited for another Sunday morning together, uh, virtually. This week, I was listening to a podcast, and I learned something really interesting that I found interesting. And that is that the word virtue, uh, if you study its etymology, uh, it goes all the way back to a Latin word uh, that is ver. And ver means man or human. And I just thought that that was super interesting because if you think about humans and you think about the word virtue and you think about that, the word virtue comes from the word human. It's like, to me, it kind of communicates that, you know, all people, all of us have good on the inside. All of us have virtue on the inside of us. And I think that in what we're all going through right now, what our country and the world is going through, it's so important to remember that, to remember that all of us are humans. All of us deserve love and care, and uh, all of us have good on the inside of us um, that God really wants to bring out and highlight and show us. Um, so as we get prepared today to enter into some worship and to listen to an amazing message from Pastor John, um, I just hope that uh, you remember that, um, and that as we go throughout this week, we remember that as well. All right, let's get ready to worship. vessel of your peace where there is war let fighting cease all that divides us come reconcile us make me a vessel of your peace Make me a vessel of your love Where there is hatred, break it up All creeds and colors bind us together Make me a vessel of your love Pour me out Pour me out, pour me out, wherever I am, wherever I go, pour me out, pour me out, pour me out, wherever I am, wherever I go. Make me a vessel of your hope Where dreams are dead, come wake them up A new horizon, I feel it rising Make me a vessel of your hope And pour me out Pour me out, pour me out, wherever I am, wherever I go, pour me out, pour me out, pour me out, wherever I am, wherever I go. 
Like a rushing river let mercy flow Through my heart to my world Like a rushing river let mercy flow Through my heart to my world Like a rushing river let mercy flow Through my heart to my world Like a rushing river let mercy flow Through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world and pour me out and pour me out and pour me out wherever I am wherever I go pour me out and pour me out and pour me out wherever I Wherever I go Thank you Jesus Fill us up oh Lord And pour us out Jesus Like a rushing river Let mercy flow Through my heart To my world Like a rushing river Let mercy flow Through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do. I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do. I will love
Hey guys, welcome back to the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for sharing uh, your sermon with us last week. It was an amazing um, uh, interlude in between uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It was absolutely wonderful uh, and amazing. Thank you so much uh, for being part of our family. Um, so that being said, um, Again, we continue on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this, this is going to be a lot of information because 
We've, we've almost gone through the entire chapter five of Matthew. And so what we're gonna be doing is the rest of Matthew um, because I, <clears throat> it, it was weird to try to separate uh, as Jesus is talking about um, how he has come to fulfill the law. It was different, it was, it was difficult to separate that stuff. So I had to mash it all in there. So whew, hang on, this is going to be a long ride, but we're good because we're in pajamas and we're drinking coffee. So you know what, we're fine. Um, so, so we are talking about uh, how Jesus, he, he's, he's, at the, he's on the mount and he's saying, I, had not, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. <clears throat> now, I have a visual prepared for you uh, to illustrate uh, what most of us have either overcomplicated uh, or interpreted incorrectly. Now, I will say, I must warn you, um, this is going to be grotesque. I would turn my children away from the camera just for a moment. Here we go. So, as you can see, my smile is incomplete because I am missing a tooth. Now, just like my smile is incomplete, the law is also incomplete without Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law, much like this tooth now fulfills my smile completely. Good? Was that, that wasn't as gross as, okay. Um, I thought it worked. I thought it worked. Um, <clears throat> Christ came to fulfill the law. <clears throat> He then gives six examples, after he says that, he gives six examples of the law, um, and we'll, we'll go through what, what Jesus meant by fulfilling the law, of course, first, and then go through those six examples. Um, and it really comes down to uh, loving God and loving people, and what that actually looks like from Jesus' perspective uh, and how demanding love really is. I'm going to ask at this time that you silence your cell phones. How rude. I don't understand why people do that. Anyways, <clears throat> what did Jesus mean by saying that he came to fulfill the law and not abolish it? Let's first start by reading verses 17 through 20 in Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to overturn or do away with the law or the words of our prophets. To the contrary, I have not come to overturn them, but to fulfill them. This, beloved, is the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not one letter, not one pen stroke will disappear from the sacred law. For everything, everything in the sacred law will be fulfilled and accomplished. Anyone who breaks even the smallest, most obscure commandment, not to mention teaches others to do the same, will be called small and obscure in the kingdom of heaven. Those who practice the law and teach others how to live the law will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> For I tell you this, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness goes deeper than the Pharisees, even more righteous than the most learned learner of the law. There are 613 commands that are given to Israel in the first five books of the Bible. Uh, we call that the Torah, and, and that is translated in English as the law, um, mainly because they're, all the laws are in those five uh, books. Um, but it would kind of cheapen those first five books, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, wait, yeah, Numbers and Deuteronomy. <laughs> it, would, it would cheapen those five books to just say that all they are just a book of laws when they're really not. That is a story uh, that, that is the first part of the story in the larger story. It just so happens in those five books, there is uh, most of these laws or the 630 commandments. Um, we see in Genesis and Exodus the creation of man, 
uh, their rebellion, uh, then God choosing Abraham and his family to bless the nations. Um, <clears throat> soon, Abraham and his entire family are then enslaved. After that in slavery, they are freed, of course. And then we see uh, God making a covenant with his, with his people after that freedom. Um, and the law is like the terms of that covenant. So uh, those terms... Uh, not only made Israel different uh, from any other people, but it, it gave them instruction on things like social justice, uh, morality, uh, which if followed would show other people in, in that time frame what God is actually like. So we then see Israel rebel against these laws. So then we see in Leviticus through Deuteronomy uh, a continuation of the story with God's people rebelling and receiving more laws and rebelling again and again receiving more laws. And this pattern uh, continues, the trend continues, which <clears throat> takes us to the conclusion of Deuteronomy, which has Moses, um, he, he's, he's kind of concluding with the people before they enter the promised land. And this is very important, very significant, because Moses is a Christ type. Um, he is looked at as someone who is very much like Christ. So he is giving a conclusion to the people that their hearts are hard. And the only way to be able to um, adhere to the law of God is to soften their hearts. Uh, well, or transform these hearts. <clears throat> so... In the section of the Old Testament that consists of the prophets, uh, and we can see the prophets hearkening back to the, the original statement by Moses, which he, which he zeroes in on the heart of the people. We can see in Ezekiel how Ezekiel says, he will, a spirit will, the Spirit of God will be sent to be able to soften the hard hearts of his people. And Jeremiah says, once that happens, then, um, once that happens, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm blanking here. Oh, once that happens, then obedience becomes less of a duty and more of a natural thing to obey uh, the laws of God. <clears throat> Um, and, a, and, a, and of course, we get to Isaiah, and Isaiah is talking about how God is going to bring up a leader to then lead his people and, and changing their hearts to actually uh, obey the laws uh, of God. Now, um, that, that leader, of course, is Jesus Christ. So let's jump to Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, saying that he is the fulfillment of the law and not the abolisher. Jesus is the continuation of the story from Genesis all the way to the New Testament. Um, that if we would just obey, and Jesus is he's so, so awesome when he says this, but he's like, if you would just obey those two commandments, love God and love people, uh, which all of the law and all of the prophets hang on, uh, then, then you would be good which we look at and we're like, oh yeah, that's cool. Like, we can do that. Um, and I, it's, of course, harder. Um, it's harder than it looks. It's harder than it reads. Um, I think we like the idea of loving people and stuff, but uh, when, when our hearts are infected by something called sin, then it, it makes uh, a default for our heart uh, and, and its default is to be opposed to the law of God. Um, so what do we do as humans? We come up with our own law of morality. It makes us feel like we are good people. Um, and and, and it, makes me f it makes us feel like we do love, we do love well. So in the points following, as Jesus is talking about anger and he's talking about lust and he's talking about these things, he, he kind of shows how, how love is actually more demanding than we once thought. 
um, it, it requires all of us and actually requires more from us. Uh, hence, our Savior, we must cling to him dearly for us to um, replicate uh, what our Savior did for us and how he demonstrated that love. <clears throat> so before I get into this, I, I, I need us to consider the context of this, the context of, of who Jesus is speaking to uh, right now. Who is he addressing? So most, if not all people uh, that were there on that mount were disciple, either disciples of Jesus, followers of, of Jesus, and that, and that could be anyone from somebody who's followed and, and trying now to be a disciple of Jesus, uh, following Jesus out of curiosity, following Jesus because they saw a miracle, following Jesus because they heard stories of Jesus from a faraway land and have now come to where Jesus was physically to see if it was true. Um, it, it also could be people that disagreed with his theology, his theology, <laughs> his theology, uh, which there were a lot of people who did disagree. So they might also be there as well because they know exactly where he's going. It was very, it was highly unlikely that a random person who never heard about Jesus in their life was there. These people knew who Jesus was. They were familiar with the culture. They were familiar of temple. They were familiar with the law being read out loud to them. These people knew. We must consider that context. So Jesus starts with anger, verse 21. You have heard that it has, that it has been said to those of old. <clears throat> Sorry, let me start all over. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fires of hell. So in effect, Jesus is saying, uh, Pharisees, <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to apply the commandment solely within a legal framework, then you will need to feed into the legal system every case where there has been a rush of anger or words of insult. What is more, you will need to treat all of these as capital cases. Or more exactly, your courts will need to be able to send culprits to hell. That is, that's pretty gnarly. In verse 23, <clears throat> So, oh no, I am out of order here. Hold on a second. No, I'm not, I'm not out of order. All right, here we are. <laughs> so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Worship that is acceptable to God cannot take place against the background of a damaged human relationship that is being ignored. The perspective here is related to that of Isaiah chapter 58, verses 2 through 7. Um, do not write, write that scripture down, Isaiah 58, 2 through 7, but do not go there now. It is just something to refer back to. It is the context of this. It's, it's talking about a superficial people who give uh, God the offerings and, and the postures of worship that he has instructed them to do, but their hearts are, they're shallow in it. Uh, they've, they've sure they've done, they've done the the, the outside things, but inside their hearts don't follow the basic principles of love. Uh, so it's very shallow, it's very superficial, uh, and he can't stand it. Um, when, I, when I hear this, you know, um, it immediately takes me back to uh, going to a traditional Sunday service, entering into a posture of worship, you know, where your, your hands are up and you're just like receiving from God. And in the middle of that intimate place, you remember that you have a grievance towards somebody or, or maybe someone has a grievance towards you in that moment. And Jesus here is saying, this is so important. 
it's like in that moment you leave, you leave your offering at the altar and you go and you make amends to whatever that is. It is so important. So I'm going to repeat this again because this bears witness so much to my heart. Worship that is acceptable to God cannot take place against a background of a damaged human relationship which is being ignored. It's not saying take time to pray about getting this stuff together. It's not saying that. It's saying you need to take action now. It is so basic and it is, it is the epicenter of love. He doesn't care about superficial stuff. He wants the real stuff. Verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Least your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So it's, it, it may not say in, in that moment, make friends. It more is saying, um, uh, be reconciled to whatever disagreement is happening um, be, because whatever, whatever it takes uh, will, be, will be a less costly alternative than what will happen if, 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 if we don't repair that relationship or, or look for some kind of reconciliation. Um, <clears throat> the, journey, the journey to the court actually presents uh, a window of opportunity uh, to, to be able to reconcile. Because once the judge is involved, the wheels of justice will be unstoppable. Uh, and, and that, no, you, you can no longer control that. That is out of your control. And the accused will be handed over to the judge and so on and so forth until you have nothing left. Let's go to, now, now we're going to lust in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, this is a look that, that has sexual arousal in mind and may well involve contemplating the steps to adultery in one's own imagination. Um, so let me be clear. Jesus is not talking about being sexually attracted to somebody. Uh, we are sexual beings. It is beautiful, and that is how we were made. What Jesus is talking about is the sexual immorality that goes beyond just the physical act of adultery. If your right eye causes you to sin, in verse 29, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So the challenge is to go to whatever extreme is necessary to eliminate sin. So by taking up dramatic and extreme instances that this text urges us to do, uh, such a level of seriousness, seriousness about avoiding sin that there will be unrestrained commitment of all possible means to avoid it. The goal is what is important here, not the means. So I, I liken it to, we, we, can, we can say now that uh, a smartphone is, is probably just as important as, as one of our hands. Like, I mean, it's almost a need these days. And I have seen people abandon their smartphones simply because they, they want to so badly break off uh, this, this, um, this almost like a, a hook of lust that hooks into you. They are able to cut that off, which is a humongous detriment in, especially in our society now, they're willing to do that. So going to those extremes, what extremes are we willing to take? Jesus is asking us, and he's saying, you need to do everything you can to, to try to flush or run away from that. It is such a gnarly place to be. Um, and saying all of that, you know, now he takes us into divorce, which I, I think is so interesting that he, that he flows like that. In verse 31, 
It says, uh, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So there, there's be, verse 31 and verse 32, um, there's an easy assumption of the right of divorce and the view that divorce is this easily gained kind. Uh, so is, is no true divorce, it's not really a true divorce, but only a license for adultery. Uh, for example, so literally all a man had to do back in those days was to write on a piece of parchment, I want a divorce, and then they would get a divorce. And he was now free to pursue uh, another woman rightfully and honorably. Uh, because he had done what the law required. Uh, on the other hand, all the woman needed to do was manipulate her situation so as to gain a divorce. Either of those cases are not right and are not acceptable. So what did Jesus mean also about marrying a divorced woman and therefore committing adultery? Well, referencing what I just said, Jesus is targeting the man or woman who claims to be dedicated to God and yet crafts ways to easily get out of one of the holiest covenants that we can make as Christians. So it is therefore likely that the intention of the present gospel text is to challenge easy divorce. Whether initiated by the husband or provoked by the wife, marriage is not a contract to be canceled when no longer convenient, but rather a covenant relationship that calls for sustained faithfulness. Let's go into oaths. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord that you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, for by the earth, for it is... <clears throat> or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So when I was younger in the church, I remember someone in the church teaching about this, and they likened this. They actually said that this was much like pledging. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was right in the middle of a pledge for my private school, we were raising money, and I had taken people's pledges uh, depending on how well I could run miles. Um, so they would pledge. So you can imagine my uh, shock as I was told basically that I, not only I was sinning, but I was also getting others around me to sin as well, uh, Christians and non-Christians, uh, signing these pledges or promises or oaths or whatever you want to call them. Um, so what... Uh, hmm. In the context of what Jesus was talking about, there does seem to be a concern, though, about human beings overreaching themselves by involving the divine mystery in their oaths. Like, I swear to God, or I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear, and then you name an organization. Um, the challenge that Jesus is putting forth is to stand as far as one's word is concerned nakedly <laughs> on one's own integrity. The responsibility is my own. Uh, let's go into retaliation, chapter, or verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him and the other also. Jesus speaks, in, right here, he's speaking against those who would use the Old Testament's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, to justify aggressive protection of their own rights and interests. So Jesus insists that in situations of challenge, the other person should not be treated as an antagonist to be fiercely resisted. Rather, a preference for suffering wrong over feeding the spiral of violence. 
In verse 40, it says, and if, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. We're talking like all your clothes. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Jesus encourages generosity, which could change the transaction from one in which both of those party, whether you're the one suing or the one forcing, to feel worse about each other after the encounter of a positive human interaction. Uh, and an example of this, and this is no way, shape, or form, it's just a very small example, is, is me with Riley as, you know, Riley's frustrating me because maybe she doesn't clear the, the, the lawn of all the toys and all the stuff that all the guinea pigs play on, and she leaves them out for a day, and I yell at her, I'm like, Riley, you're supposed to take all that stuff and move it, put it back. So she says, and I'm really aggravated, my voice changes, my flight, everything's crazy. She's like, yes, dad. She answers very nicely, very sprightly, goes out there, takes it all, and but does more, even starts watering the grass. And then after, I'm like, wow, okay, that was a little harsh. Um, and then I take her and apologize for my behavior, um, which may have been uh, inappropriate. Uh, so verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow for it from you. So Jesus calls for generosity again, rather than pushing the other way on the ground that what is mine is my own and I intend to keep it. No doubt the intent for all of this is overcome evil with good. Love your enemies, verse 43. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more, are, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Yikes. Um, so in this text, to, to love one's enemies is to rise above what is often the pettiness of our own personal animosities in the interests of the community of the people of God. We're going past our own spheres. We're realizing that we are surrounded by a much bigger, much important community of people. One is to put community values ahead of individual hurts. The limitation of this generosity is that it reaches only one's own kind. So like, like Jesus said, do not even the Gentiles do the same. So it's not anything big that we're loving our own kind or our own uh, families or myself, it's bigger. Love is bigger than that. We must, we must love the entire family. Um, praying for, and then on top of that, praying for someone who is seen here as a deeply personal expression of an inner orientation of the heart, praying for uh, an enemy. It is not meant to be an easy option. It is persecution for staying true to one's own fundamental commitments, our fundamental commitment that we love like Jesus loves. I'm concluding with this. Our hearts are not currently equipped to love others, but where we are lacking, Jesus is not. He showed us what it was like to perfectly love God and to love people. He even loved his enemies unto death on the cross. Romans chapter 13 verse eight says this. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Amen. Hi there, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm so encouraged and so excited to be part of a church family that is not only faithful in their giving when tomorrow seems promised, but we're a church family that is faithful in our giving when tomorrow seems unknown and when it's not convenient. So if you would like to give today, here are the ways. You can go to our website, harvestlands.org, go to the giving tab. You can text the word harvestlands 
to the number 77977. You'll receive a text message and I'll give you instructions on how to give. You can also send a check to the Harvest Lands PO Box 2, Salinas, California 93902. If you are someone who may want to give a little extra, if I can suggest the Benevolence Fund. The Benevolence Fund will be used with the discretion of our financial counsel for those of us who maybe have lost our jobs or lost part of our income. And if you are that person, I please want to encourage you to email us at theharvestlands at gmail.com or call us at 831-757-3677. I love you guys. I hope you know you're not alone. And I hope this message today was encouraging and helps you point to Jesus and to reflect his love.